You're listening to the Love Unplugged podcast, episode 59. Today we are diving deep into a behavior that many of us have experienced, self-sabotage. So what exactly is self-sabotage? What are the signs that we are self-sabotaging? How do we stop this behavior? We answer these questions and so much more. So if this is something that you struggle with, grab yourself a cup of organic tea and get a comfy spot and get ready to learn from my guest who shares all her knowledge and experience in navigating it herself. So without further ado, let's get to it. Hey there, I'm your host, Jessica Fregan, and I am passionate about doing the inner work needed to reach your goals. Let me be your guide as we navigate all the fears and insecurities that surface when it's time to step outside of your comfort zone. Along with my knowledgeable guests and industry experts, I'm here to teach you how to reawaken your life purpose and passion and create the steps to turn your intentions into action. Ultimately, my goal is to empower you to rise above the blocks holding you back and start living the life you are worthy and deserving of. Come on, it's time to slow down, find a comfy spot with your favorite organic tea and get inspired. Thank you for tuning in to the Love on Plug podcast. Hello loves, today I am joined by Brianna Wiest, who is an author and speaker. She has built a worldwide readership through thousands of published articles and tens of millions of views. She is a senior contributor at Forbes, a top contributor at Medium, and writes and consults for national publications. Brianna has traveled internationally as a journalist, written for Fortune 500 companies, and has spoken in cities around the continental United States. She is the author of five books with her latest, The Mountain Is You, Transforming Self-Sabotage into Self-Mastery, is being published in June of this year, so 2020. Her dream is to use the power of words to help people awaken their fullest potential, build emotional intelligence, and fulfill their life purpose, which I think is just amazing. So welcome, Brianna. I am so honored to have you as my guest, and I'm so excited to learn all about your story and advice. But before we start, for those that don't know you yet, I would love for you to share a little bit about who you are. Great. Thank you so much for having me. The honor is mine. Um, Hi, my name is Brianna. I am a writer and an author. I live in Pennsylvania with my husband and my two cats. And I write about self-introspection and nature and empowerment and productivity. And it's pretty much an umbrella over everything that I, that I like to do. Um, and I'm primarily a nonfiction writer, um, but I also do poetry. And um, my sixth book is coming out in June. And after that, I'm working on another poetry book after that. I saw that you had a poetry book and I was so intrigued by that. I definitely want to get it to see what it's all about because I love poetry. Okay, so I want to start with um, your newest book, which the moment I saw that your post on Instagram about it, I was like, oh, this is amazing. I I can't wait to read this. And I want to learn all about self-sabotage. And I know a lot of people are going to benefit from hearing your advice and, and everything that you know about this subject. So let's start at the very beginning. What exactly is self-sabotage? So self-sabotage is actually a self-defense mechanism and a self-preservation mechanism. And that's why we, it feels so hard to get over it. And a lot of people really never do fully get out of their own way. It's because self-sabotage arises when we have two coexisting but conflicting needs. One is conscious and one is unconscious. So we might consciously know a way that we want to move our lives forward. For example, I want to be in a healthy, loving relationship. But unconsciously, we have, let's say, a limiting belief structure about what love looks like, maybe something we developed or adopted in childhood. Who knows? So in pursuing a healthy, loving relationship, it's actually calling into question our belief system. Um, It's invalidating what we think is true. And so it's kind of setting us up on this kind of existential crisis. So this is just one example of why we self-sabotage. It's because there is an unconscious need that the self-sabotaging behavior is meeting. Hmm. Okay. Where does self-sabotage start? Like where is it rooted from? So you mentioned um, belief systems. Does it always start from your belief system or can it be from basically anything? That's a really good question. And I would say that you're right, that the foundation probably is a 
belief system because that's what everything really comes down to at the end of the day, which is our beliefs about ourselves and our lives. That's what we pursue, that's what we allow, that's what we're okay with. Um, but my first reaction was also to say comfort zones. So it's, it's really about what we unconsciously think is acceptable, uh, what, what we're allowed to do and not, what we're deserving of and not, um, what we're worthy of and not. Mm -hmm. um, I think that tends to be the root of a lot of self-sabotaging behaviors as well. Oh, and the other one is um, lack of clarity. So that's another big one, which is sometimes when people are kind of slacking or sabotaging their efforts to move their lives forward, it's because they're creating obstructions to the end goal because they don't want that end goal. You know, their parents told them they wanted this. Their peers told them they wanted this. They, they think that it'll impress people by wanting this. But deep down, it's not in alignment with their genuine desires for their, their lives. And so, you know, it's like, well, why can't I, you know, I hear about writing a lot of the time, which is people are like, I, you know, I really want to write and I just can't bring myself to do it. I'm like, well, then you don't really want to write. <laughs> you don't, because if you did, you would do it naturally, mm. effortlessly. That's so interesting. I want to kind of dive in a little bit to how do we figure out where it's rooted from? So like, say you do have, you've noticed that you have this self-sabotage behavior around something specific. How do you determine if it's rooted from a belief or um, rooted because you actually don't want to be doing that? So I think a lot of entrepreneurs will resonate with that because sometimes, you know, you're you're doing something that you're actually like resisting quite a bit. You don't want to do it. You just don't feel like writing about it. You know, it just doesn't feel like it's coming naturally and with ease. How do you figure out exactly where it's from so that you can deal with that situation? So it's really just one question that you need to ask yourself, which is this, why would I not want the thing that I say that I want? Why do I not want this thing? And that's the question you have to sit with. That is going to give you the answer. Gotcha. Okay. My next question is about what can self-sabotage that behavior teach us about what's going on subconsciously? Like what insights can it give us about what's going on that we may not be aware of internally? Yeah, it connects us to our fundamental wants and needs. So if we consciously don't understand who we are and what we want, our unconscious minds will let us know. And, and often it happens through self-sabotage. Um, you know, I, I think of just kind of one-off examples, but just to illustrate, I, I had a friend once who um, kept sabotaging her progress in, in making more money. And she had these, you know, all these opportunities. And, and she would say, and she was aware of it. She was like, I, I know I could be doing this and doing this. And, and I, this opportunity was here for me. And this job is here for me. And I just can't bring myself to do it. And when she started really doing the inner work of why am I sabotaging my potential progress, what she discovered was that um, when she is fi felt financially stable, it actually cleared up more of her time. So when she wasn't just kind of scrambling to survive, she would have her weekends open and her evenings free. And in those moments, she felt profoundly alone and her biggest issue with her life was feeling like she didn't have many friends. She didn't have a relationship. Um, she was, I, I, I guess, in maybe her thirties or forties at this point and had felt like she really failed. So actually by sabotaging her effort to make money, she was actually almost clouding out of her consciousness, the real problem, which is that she felt a profound lack of connection and love in her life. So what she figured out was the issue isn't that she needs more money or wants more money and can't get it. The issue is that she really wants connection and feels she can't get it. So she's sabotaging another part of her life. So she doesn't have to come to terms with that. Does that make sense? Oh my God. I feel like you just talked about me. <laughs> I'm like, am I this friend? <laughs> oh my God, no. <laughs> Honestly, um, it's, it's healing just to hear, you know, what other people do and think and feel and, and, People say this all the time now that we've been talking about the book more and more. They're like, oh my God, I do that. I'm like, we all do. Like, I do it too. Like, <laughs> we all like we all do this. Like, you don't ever have to feel like bad or alone. Like, we are all doing one that people always come back to me and say, oh my God, I do that is um I I wrote it in the book. Um, I, I call it uprooting. It's yeah. so like an example of uprooting is like you know you need to be, for example, working on your podcast or booking more podcast interviews, but you're spending your afternoons just like tweaking the font on your website for hours. Um, that one, people always come back and like, I do that. That's exactly what I do. But it's because you're just like avoiding the work. <laughs> 
Oh my God. <laughs> that is hilarious. Cause I have been like trying with all this new time, I've been trying to like really point, get really point form with like what I'm like working on and what I'm putting my energy towards. And I'm like, this isn't going to move anything forward. I'm like, why am I spending so much energy on this? And I'm not doing this other thing that I actually need to be doing that is actually going to move my business forward. Like, why yeah. am I resisting this so much? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we get all caught up and like hyper vigilant, like, well, this website does not look absolutely perfect. It needs to be perfect. And, you know, and we stop thinking about, you know, am I actually getting an outcome here? Am I actually benefiting from this? Is this actual progress? And then, yeah, I, I do it too all the time. So <laughs> don't even worry. <laughs> You know, it actually blew my mind a little while ago. I came to the realization that nothing is ever going to be perfect. Like uh -huh. even if I uh -huh. get my website or like a graphic really, really good and I'm so super pumped about it and so super proud in like a week or whatever time frame, I'm going to come across something else that I really love and that inspires me to like do something different with my stuff because now I don't feel like it's as good because now I'm liking this other thing or, you know, it, it's all about perception, right? Like one thing you, you could be thinking is perfect one second and then like, nope, actually it's not. I need to tweak it even more. Or I saw something else that actually makes me think that this isn't as good anymore because, you know, this was done by like some professional or even with professionals, like with content editors, things like that, it's everybody's own take on everything. There's never like one true perfect way of doing anything. You're absolutely right. It, it's never going to be perfect. And you have to like let go by understanding it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And the way that I kind of came to terms with that was seeing so many people who I look up to and like idolize in their careers and their lives. And they definitely don't have like a perfect website or a perfect picture out of what, whatever it is. And I'm like, oh, because it doesn't matter because it's the quality of whatever work you're offering. That's what people connect to. And it's the accessibility. Like it doesn't even need to be fancy. It's just people have to get the info and be able to easily navigate and, uh, and know how to interact with you or how to connect with you if they need to. And other than that, like people don't care. Um, mm -hmm. It was, I guess, a year ago and I was redoing like my own like site. I don't know how this became a podcast about websites, but I like it. I like it. Um, what I realized from seeing a screenshot from someone else's phone was that the fonts actually like they didn't have them on their Android or something. So it actually looked completely different. And I was like, oh my gosh, for whatever percentage of people looking, it, it looks totally different based on like what, what device they're accessing it from. And so at that point I was like, all right, I just need to let go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just be clear and accessible and good enough. And then I need to focus on the things that like actually matter, which is the quality of the content and of my life and how I'm showing up. Exactly. I think it's just being really self-aware and taking that time to um, look at what you're focusing your time on and seeing if it's actually important. Does it actually matter? Is it going to do anything to benefit whoever you're serving or even yourself? Amen. Yeah. All right. So I want to get back to self-sabotage. <laughs> I know we kind of went on a little tangent there, um, but what are the signs that we are self-sabotaging? I know your book goes into so much detail and has so many different signs that people can experience, but I want to dive deeper into resistance, perfectionism, and fear of failing, which I think my community is totally going to resonate with. Mm -hmm. So the, the, basically the number one symptom of self-sabotage is just discomfort. And discomfort puts on many different masks, but it's just discomfort, discomfort that also grows with time. Like it gets worse and worse, even though you try to take action. Um, also, you're not making progress. That's the other one. You see a problem, you know you need to fix it. You know it's really in your best interest to do something about this. And yet you'd be surprised that for a lot of people, the problems that persist, these have been going on for years. Like you can trace a lot of this back to like high school, middle school, where this all originated. Um, so tell me again, which were the three? Perfectionism was the first one, right? Resistance, but we can start with perfectionism. <laughs> no, I'll go in your order. Re resistance. Um, I, I actually think that resistance comes up when we're not in full alignment with what we need and want to be doing. I really do. Um, I've discovered this in my own work, which was every time I either didn't know what I was trying to say or was trying to write it in a way that was 
too far removed from how I naturally speak or think, I would just get completely blocked. And then I would put the computer down and I'd walk away, you know, for a day. And when I would come back the next day, I'd be like, oh, I don't even want to be spending my time doing this. This makes no sense. There's no purpose. There's no impact here. This, this isn't helpful. This isn't it. And when I am in alignment, when I know what I need to do and why, we enter that flow state. So I actually think that resistance is an opportunity. It's, it's, it's almost like a little like pinch. It's almost like a little nudge being like, hey, I need you to take a step back and look at the big picture for a second. Is this what you really want to be doing? Is this really going to get you the outcome that you desire? Um, this is really in alignment with what you want and need out of your life. Because I mean, pretty much all of the time you're going to realize, no, either the whole thing, <laughs> we're totally off path, but more, <laughs> but more, more commonly, uh, if one or two elements is not quite right. So uh, the next day I would come back and yes, I'm still writing an article. It could be about the same topic, but I'm, I'm framing it differently. I'm approaching it differently. The headline is different. It's in alignment now. So that's resistance. Um, it's a nudge and it's a call from something deep inside of you telling you, Hey, this isn't quite right. You need to take a step back and really look at it and get, and get honest with yourself. Um, number two is perfectionism. Mm -hmm. So I think that everyone pretty much has this deep, deep down the same core wound and fear, which is that I am not good enough. Pretty much all of our fears boil down to that. It's, I fear I will not be accepted. I fear I will not be loved. I fear I will not make it, which is, you know, a layer deeper. I am not good enough. I feel this and see this and talk about this. My friends, my family, everyone. It's, I, the way I look is not enough. The work I do is not enough. The money I make is not enough. My house is not enough. It's never enough. It's never enough. And so a way that we maladapt to that is perfectionism. So instead of addressing the subtle feeling of I'm not enough for other people, which is actually just I'm not enough for myself, we try to overcompensate and try to make things foolproof. We, 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 we almost, it's almost like perfectionism looks to me in my mind, like I'm almost sealing it off. So no one could criticize me. No one could say anything negative about me. No one could point out a fear that I already have about myself and I can't stand for someone else to call to my attention. Um, I think it's really a way that you disconnect from yourself because I think that at our core, we actually do not care about things being perfect. And if we did, we would make them perfect pretty effortlessly. Like when you are, you know, an artist and you are working on your book, your whatever, your master, whatever you're creating in your life, and it is your true desire, your true purpose, your true calling, you reach for perfectionism naturally. You want that to be as beautiful as it could possibly be to you. And you don't even really think, you know, well, will other people like this? Because you don't care because you're like, yeah, well, I love it. And so that element of do I love my life is what's always missing when perfectionism is coming up. And what was the third one? Fear of failing. Oh, this is one of my <laughs> big <favorite>. one. <laughs> Block me off for another hour because, oh boy. Um, <laughs> the fear of failure is pretty much <laughs> stopping you from doing everything you want to be doing in your life. And it's crazy because the things that you imagine on a scale of one to 10, to be like the worst ever things that could happen to you, the things that you fear, the things you think are a 10. Um, Tim Ferriss says this, which is they're probably only like a three or a four. Like, yeah, it, it's going to, you know, it's a setback. It's an inconvenience. It's annoying, but it's not going to end your life. It's not going to ruin your life. Um, and I, I really think that misperception is where the fear of failure comes from. We misperceive that if we don't do this perfectly right away, it's going to in some way end our lives, end our potential and people's love for us. And it never works like that. And, and you have to move past into a mindset of, if this happens, all right. I actually love to fly on airplanes. And this is a big fear that people have airplanes mm. and flying. And I was speaking to someone about it and I, they were saying how anxious they are because the plane could crash. And then I thought to myself, why am I not afraid to fly on an airplane? And then I thought, oh, it's because I tell myself, I mean, well, if it crashes and I die, then I guess I die. And I just had this, I just kind of was like, whatever, like, I'm not going to not live my life, not travel, not like go to different cities for work because of this like one off. And it was this acceptance of, all right, well, then we figure it out. Um, so fear of failure is also, I'm afraid of 
that people will criticize me. This is something I've like really learned to live with over like seven or eight years now. Um, I wouldn't want to put my work out there because people are going to call me stupid. They're not, they're going to think it's not good enough. They're going to comment really negatively on my appearance. And I had to get to a point of like, all right, all right. <laughs> but then they call me stupid. Then they leave me a one star review and they say I'm ugly. I don't know. Like I can't not live my life. Like you, you, you have to come into an acceptance of the failure because we all fail in big and little ways. And once you realize that it's not the end, then you can keep persevering. It's just something else to learn from, something else to move through. It's always going to happen. It just can't be the reason why you don't do what you know you were born to do. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's just so well said. And you know, for me, flying as well, when I used to fly all the time, I never quite understood. Like for me, it didn't even like enter my brain that we were even in the air. (laughs) So I never quite understood the fear of flying before, but now I kind of do. Well, yeah, and and a way to overcome fears that you do have in your life is to think about something that you aren't afraid of, that a lot of other people are, and then start asking yourself, why am I not afraid of this thing? And the answer is always, because I don't believe it will be the end of me. Like, even if it happened, yeah, it would be annoying, but like, I'm still going to move on. Um, my friend who I we had spoken about before we were recording um, is an entrepreneur. She gets like a like a one star review on Yelp, and I was like, yeah, how do you deal with that? She's like, I don't know. I'm not going to like close my business if one person didn't like it. Like, we try to do everything we can to correct it. And we don't want that to happen, but like, I don't know, whatever. And seeing how she was just, this isn't going to be the end of me, and and also hearing her say like. If I get a one-star review, I'm not going to close my business. I was like, okay, like if someone doesn't like my book or someone gives me a one-star review, does it mean I like close my business and just like never do anything ever again? Um, it, there's just a level of acceptance because the fear of failure, because you, you are going to fail. You're failing every day in different ways. Mm-hmm. And when you learn to lean into that, you just stop being afraid of it. Mm-hmm. I remember seeing somebody on Instagram that I follow Um, She was saying how she had a huge fear of flying and stuff, which this can translate into basically any type of fear that you have. But she was saying the fear of missing out from not doing the thing that she was afraid of doing was actually greater than her fear of actually flying. So not being able to go on their work trips, not to being able to travel the world, all those things that she would be missing out were actually way more or bigger than the actual fear itself. So that's what helped her get over that. So like with business, you know, if you get a one-star review or somebody doesn't like your business, the fear of what you can't, like you would miss out from actually having your business and all the opportunities that come along with it, all the people that you're going to help, that's got to be bigger than the one-star review that you might get or the couple of people that might not enjoy what you're putting out. You are absolutely spot on. That was so well said, which is the fear of maybe being disliked. Because I do think like the fear of failure actually is deeply linked to the fear of being disliked. Mm -hmm. The fear of being disliked cannot be bigger than your fear of not being able to live the life of your dreams. Like we need to put this all in perspective now. Like you need to be more afraid of that. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) definitely. Uh, So I want to talk about the preparation of taking this this step into doing this inner work that is going to have to happen to get over this self-sabotaging behavior. So how do we prepare ourselves on all levels to start this journey of healing? Well, it's such a beautiful question. So um, I think you should be make it a ritual um, because otherwise what most people do is they kind of get started and then they just forget about it. And then it's a problem later on. It's never really finished. But when we make a ritual out of it, which is okay, I'm going to journal every day, or I'm going to check back in with a therapist once a week, or I'm going to talk to my friend, or I'm going to go on a trip, this is something I like to do. And on these four or five days that I'm gone, I'm going to focus solely on this issue. We have to create space for it and make an intention to deal with it, not just, well, you know, I'll figure it out later because then you never do. And then we have to two things. One, we need to open our minds to what could be possible in our lives because I feel like the biggest hurdle I I want people to get over is just even believing that a life beyond what you know right now is possible for you. You just have to choose it. Um, This has happened to me so many times. Oh my God, I cannot even tell you how many times in my life. A better life, a greater existence, more profound work, more money, whatever it was, was immediately available to me. I just had to choose it and choosing it stemmed from, I have to believe that this is even possible. So you need to go in believing 
I can get clarity. I can heal even if it's been 15 years of suffering. I can have a different relationship. I'm willing to see my life change. So that openness and willingness to see the impossible become possible, it's a big ask. But I, I find that just saying I'm willing to see my life change kind of starts to turn the tide. Because instead of being like, no, my life will change, you don't believe that yet because it has never changed in the past. So put that out of your head and just say, I am willing to see this change. I'm willing to see myself heal. I'm willing to just explore whether it would be possible to do this. That's the first thing. And then the next one is you need to accept what you might lose because it's probably going to be a bunch of stuff. If you get really honest with yourself, why am I self-sabotaging? Why is this not working out? What do I need to do? you're going to have to go into a dark closet and look at some demons, but this is important because then they're not going to control you anymore. So you're going to have to get real with yourself. Is this the life that I know I want and am meant to be living? Um, because the answer most likely in one way or another will be no. And then your next instinct is to want to do the easy thing, which is just like up and quit your job or just like run away or just like leave your city or leave your relationship. Now you think that's the hard thing, but that's actually the easy thing because you pretty much just, you uproot it, you let go, you move on, but you never actually confront the issue. And the issue is why am I not happy with the work I have now? And what's wrong with my day-to-day -day life? I have seen so many people you know, this job is terrible. They hate it. They go to their next thing they think is going to be the answer. And then it's not. It's the same problems over and over and over and over again. The same thing in relationships. This person doesn't do this. I don't, I don't understand them. It's not working out. They go to the next person. Guess what happens all over again, again and again and again. You're just like hopping from one thing to the next. So usually when you, you go into this place of being ready to really heal and change the course of your life, you think you're going to have to do these big hard things like, you know, pack your bags and leave the country. And maybe you do. Most of the time you don't though. Most of the time the work is kind of on the ground in the moment here and now. And what do I need to do to heal my relationships right now? The relationships I have, what would that look like for me? What would it look like to set boundaries? What would it look like to foster connection? What, what do I need to do to actually get the most out of the work that I'm doing right here and now? When we do that healing in the moment, we're not running away from it. Then we know what to do next. The answers become perfectly clear and we naturally move on to them. But we have to be willing to face the dark stuff in the moment and then to realize it's never as bad as we think it is. Really, like the fear of it clouds our judgment. It's never as bad as we fear that it might be when we refuse to look at it. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So what are the steps, without giving away too much from your book, obviously, what are some steps that someone can take to start this healing journey? So now that they're mentally and emotionally and whatnot prepared, what do they need to do in small actionable steps? I would say that basically what you have to do is reinvent your daily routine. Because when you reinvent your daily routine, you reinvent your entire life. And usually when people are trying to do a big transformation, they're thinking about the elevator speech. They're thinking about the title they want to tell people they have, the kind of relationship they want people to think they have on Instagram. They're, they're thinking of the macro and we need to get into the micro. We need to start asking, you know, how can I start restructuring my day and my life hour by hour, minute by minute to reflect what I want and need long term? Um, that's where the real work happens because that's when you get on the ground and start doing the work in your relationships, in your health, in your wellness, in your rest, in your self-care, in whatever projects you're working on in your career. You know, we can philosophize about, you know, why we want what we want or don't want what we want forever, but we're not really going to see changes made until we change what we're doing every single day. Amazing. I love that. I'm definitely going to work on that myself. I know that this whole new normal that I've experienced is definitely giving me the opportunity to take that time to make adjustments to my daily routine so that I am prioritizing what's important and setting myself up for success and being able to accomplish everything that I want, but also be healthier on every level. Absolutely. Yeah. Same. That's good. <laughs> so how can we heal those subscon subconscious beliefs that are causing the self-sabotage? Well, first of all, you just have to become aware of them. So that's, <laughs> that's actually the majority of the actual healing of it. Because once you're actually clear on what you're telling yourself day in and day out without realizing, once you realize it completely, um, you kind of change it naturally. When you, you don't really even have to force yourself. When you start realizing, oh, 
I keep getting into these really not great relationships because deep down, I don't really think that I'm worth a good relationship. And once you figure that out, you naturally course correct. You're like, yeah, no, I definitely am. And then you start shifting. So I would say that really the hardest thing is just being willing to get clear on what you're actually, what is the program that's running in your head? What is the story you are telling yourself about your life from the minute you wake up until the minute you go to bed? Because if you're like most people, the things that are running through your head are like pretend arguments, like embarrassing moments, things you did wrong, what could possibly go wrong. And then the I am statements. Oh, this is where you really get into trouble. I am a loser. I am not good at this. I'm not smart. I've never been smart. Um, I can't keep friends. I've never been able to keep friends. I suck at relationships. I've always sucked at relationships. As long as that is the story in your mind, that is your reality. That is your life. So one line at a time, we have to start shifting it from, I suck at relationships and I've always sucked at relationships. Maybe we can shift it to, well, I've sucked at relationships in the past, but I'm, I'm willing to do the work now to get better at them. And I'm willing to see my life change. Um, and then slowly we start rewriting a new story and we start rewriting the story we tell ourselves in our head. It influences our actions and our behaviors every day. Our behaviors <laughs> influence our outcomes and our outcomes create the quality of our life. Awesome. That, that definitely clears things up a little bit for me, for sure. Now I kind of want to jump into helping people get rid of that fear of the unknown when they start the journey. What can they expect in the healing process? Are they going to have um, a difficult time emotionally or mentally and whatnot? Like, is it going to be a difficult process that they need to kind of be prepared to embark on? Or, you know, what does that look like? What can they expect? Well, everyone's journey is going to be different and it doesn't necessarily have to be painful. It doesn't have to be long. It, it, it's going to be unique to you and whatever you need, but I do generally think that it involves getting clear on what your inner narrative is express, ex, excuse me, expressing your repressed emotions, especially things that you maybe have not wanted to look at or deal with. Um, and then consciously choosing what you want for your life going forward. It doesn't necessarily have to be hard. Sometimes it can be, sometimes not. Um, but I think that your, you know, we were speaking about before the fear of failure can't be bigger than the fear of not living the life you want. And in the same way, the fear of, you know, feeling a little bit uncomfortable to go on the healing process cannot be bigger than the fear of living the rest of your life still battling these same problems. I also do want to note, don't be afraid to reach out for professional help. If you need a therapist, a, a trusted friend, this is the time to reach out and lean on people. Um, and if you feel that you can't do it on your own, just know there are so many resources available to you um, and to not be afraid or to think it's weak to reach out. It's absolutely not. I actually think everyone needs therapy. <laughs> I definitely agree with that. <laughs> everyone, everyone needs therapy. Like, <laughs> I definitely agree. I'm pro therapy all the way. I think it's the most liberating feeling just being able to just let everything out in an unbiased place or space and not have anybody interject with their opinions of what you should do and what you should believe and things like that. And then just be able to have the tools to be able to do the work yourself. Yes. And I think that from my experience, at least a lot of therapy has been connecting with someone who is like a third party, as you said, who's like level headed and also give hold space for me to just express how I feel. And I've often found that just by being in the presence of someone who's willing to witness my authentic emotions and thoughts and feelings, um, I was kind of able to give myself the answers in the end, but it was so much easier and sometimes honestly impossible it, unless I was with someone who was actually holding enough space for me to just explore what I needed to explore. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Totally get that. Now, when I was reading your book, you know, I've, I've started it and I've kind of gone through a little bit before I do a deep dive, but you talked about emotional intelligence and upper limits, and those were so intriguing to me. So I kind of want to dive a little bit deeper with you on those two items. So emotional intelligence is like an umbrella term. There's like so much we could go <laughs> into. The end of the book is all about that because basically to ensure that you don't keep getting into cycles of self-sabotage, we all need to develop heightened emotional intelligence. We are collectively severely lacking it. Um, but I'll go back to that in a second. An upper limit, that's Gay Hendricks uh, term. 
um, your upper limit is pretty much the amount of happiness and goodness that you will allow in into your life. And once you start passing your upper limit, you unconsciously start sabotaging it because anything that is new, until it is also familiar, it's going to be uncomfortable. I'm going to say that one more time. Anything new, until it's also familiar, is going to be uncomfortable. So it could be positive progress. It could be unprecedented success. It could be a new level of wellness and happiness. But when it's not familiar to you and it's, you know, you're kind of, you're stepping out of, you know, your norm, I'm sure you've all experienced what happens. You, you feel joy and then immediately you start searching for why that joy shouldn't exist and what threats are right around the corner and what you should be worrying about. Or um, I've honestly heard people, you know, they get to the next level of their career and then they start like unconsciously making themselves like sick. I've heard people tell stories like this. Like I was just like always achy and tired. And what I came to find was that I just didn't believe I deserved this much goodness. So I wanted to make things bad for myself so I could be back into what's comfortable and known. So that's a, a huge one because every time my life was taking a really positive turn at first, I was like panicking. I was like, I'm so uncomfortable right now. And I, I confused that discomfort with bad. I'm like, okay, I have to be in danger. Like this isn't good. But I was making like positive, clear, positive progress steps in, in career and my personal, whatever it was, but it was new. And it is wild to me how many of us live with this veil over our eyes about what's possible in this world, the amount of happiness we're allowed or even capable of experiencing. I saw a quote once and it was like, most people have no idea how good their body was designed to feel. Like we can't even fathom like the actual limit of how much joy we can actually experience. Mm -hmm. um, and when we start kind of pushing it higher and higher, so to, to get basically what you have to do over time is to keep readjusting your upper limit. So I would say, go slow. I always say, go slow, take it one step at a time, let yourself adjust to that new normal then take it another step up and then keep moving from there. Cause eventually you're going to get to a point where the things that are speak for myself, normal to me today were like completely foreign to me just even a few years ago. Like I did, wouldn't even have known how to handle it. I wouldn't have known what to do just because it was just so, you know, unfamiliar. And I, I, you know, I wasn't, I didn't know what to expect. And that's really important. Um, so another great thing is that if you are making big changes in your life, try to keep as many constants as possible. So something that has helped me tremendously is that I focus on the things that I can do for myself, no matter where I am at, no matter who I am with, no matter what's happening in my life, the world, my career. So for me, that's, you know, I wake up, I, I have my coffee, I sit outside, I journal, what, whatever it is for you. I'm saying those are some things it is for me. Um, I can create that consistency and that sense of normalcy no matter what is going on around me. And that gives me a sense of familiarity and peace. That's very important to me if I am, you know, two hours later or that evening going to stand on a stage and speak to an audience bigger than I've ever spoken to. That's very scary. That's unfamiliar. Um, but then over time, it, it becomes normal and I don't really think about it anymore. But at first, even though it's great, it's, it's scary and it can feel wrong. And, and, and so you need to use logic, reason, and mindfulness to determine whether, you know, is this positive or am I just scared? Am I just not used to it? You know, we need to use discernment liberally here. We're making big changes. I love that advice. That's so good. And I love that you adjust slowly what your upper limits are so that yes. you're taking your time to go through that process, but you're not capping yourself you create your comfort zone and what you you'll start to crave what you repeatedly do so you need to choose wisely um you'll start to what will become normal to you is whatever you decide to repeatedly do even what you repeatedly decide to tell yourself like i walk around being like i'm a poet like that is a crazy thought to have of me like seven years ago and then i just keep thinking thinking it <laughs> just start writing poetry and then it just it starts to happen um, but it comes from that willingness to start shifting that upper limit, that belief of what could be possible. Mm -hmm. And your book definitely goes into so much detail about these things. And I definitely recommend anybody that needs help with this subject, or even maybe you don't, and you know somebody who will um, definitely purchase her book that's coming out in June. She has laid it out so easily to go through and explains everything that you need to know about this. 
thank you so much. I did try. <laughs> I did actually really try to like lay it out as like clearly as possible. <laughs> it's, so, it's done I'm, well. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm really actually happy to hear that. And thank you so much for all of your kind words. And I'm really, really glad you like it. And I hope anyone that buys it, I hope you also like it. (laughs) I'm sure they will. It's such a good book. So I want to get personal with you right now. (laughs) So I want to to hear about your journey. You know, how has your journey been? Have you experienced self-sabotage? You know, what was your experience navigating it? You know, is that how you learned all about the subject or, you know, did you know about it before maybe through like education and that's what helped you through your journey? Like how did that all go about? Yeah. So no, I knew nothing about this at all. I'm, I used to call myself the least emotionally intelligent person alive. Like it was like crazy. Like <laughs> I, I was very low functioning. I was very mentally ill. Um, I didn't have great relationships. Just at, my life is a mess. And slowly I started to realize that life was not happening to me. The majority of it was a reflection of me. And when I shifted the way I spoke, the way I treated people, the way I acted, the way I behaved, I had completely different outcomes. Then I took it a layer deeper. What if I changed the way that I think? And then the doors that that opened was almost unbelievable. That's my best-selling book, 101 Essays That Will Change the Way You Think. That was the whole point, which was I just, and that that whole book really details my own journey, getting through and and challenging my mind, challenging my thought sequences, challenging my patterns, challenging my beliefs to the point that I opened my mind to the possibilities. And it was deeply, deeply transformative. So a layer deeper than that was why am I not, so it was not just, okay, I'm, I am the one creating this chaos and drama in my life. One step deeper, why do I want to create this? And that's, that's how I arrived at self-sabotage. Now I have self-sabotaged my self-sabotage book like four or five times. I actually wrote this book in its entirety. I think four or five, maybe three or four times. Some, I can't even remember at this point, but it was many times. And a book is a lot of words. (laughs) It's a lot of writing to like just scrap because I just kept not getting it right. And I think the reason was that I hadn't fully, completely learned the lesson yet. Now I'm, I'm always learning. I'm always growing. So I'm, I'm, that I wouldn't even call myself an expert, just someone who's done a lot of reading, research, and primarily reflection and introspection. Pretty much the book just kind of details all of the tools and lessons that I used to fully step out of my own way and be someone who is not a victim, but a problem solver, someone who takes responsibility, someone who changes and influences the energy of a room instead of adapting to it instead of just seeing what the norm was and adapting to that because the norm is you know a good example is i would say in a lot of friendships the norm is to speak kind of gossipy or negatively about other people i don't play like that i don't do that anymore no way um that's a low vibrational thing um and so when i'm with people that do that i don't like correct them but i i do not engage and i change the subject so that's that's just an example um, of not just going with whatever's happening around me, but being an agent of change and being a leader and taking full responsibility for my life and my outcomes. Yes, even things that were not my fault and were not in my control because they are my problem and the outcome is still mine. And I have to decide how I'm going to live and who I'm going to be, no, no matter what obstacles come up. So I, I've been on, I, I feel I've been on a very profound journey of being deep in the pits of despair and victimhood um, to slowly over time, gradually awakening, not only to the fact that I was the primary cause of my suffering, even when things happened around me or to me, even still, they were nothing compared to the suffering that I was inflicting on myself. So just being able to get out of that, but then even step forward into, if I could use my, the power of my mind and my belief and my action and my choices and my words to move out of suffering, I bet I could do it to move myself into joy and into abundance and into impact to the the whole world. And that's the journey that I am on. And it's the journey that I want other people to join me on. And, and they're already on it, to be honest with you. It's just about connecting us because there are so many people who are on the journey. I think like everyone probably is somewhere deep down. 
it's about like connecting and speaking about like the tools that worked and what we've learned and how we can help each other. Um, I really do believe that every person has um, a fundamental purpose. Um, it's a, there's a Hawaiian parable of every person has a medicine inside of them. And our job is to discover what that medicine is and then share it with everyone around us. And I do really believe that if every single person was living in their full power and doing exactly what they were born to do, we would absolutely transform the world. I so agree. That's, that's a beautiful story. I love that you've learned all this through your own journey and now you're sharing everything that you've learned. And I feel like so many people come from that. It's not always about, you know, education and, you know, all these credentials that you have. Sometimes it's based off of experience and everything that you've applied in your life or your, your circumstance to be able to get out of it. But yeah, and you know what's so interesting is that I, I think it's I'm so far away from it, removed from it now that it doesn't occur to me that like I guess people would know because why would it come up that like I was a mess? Oh my god, <laughs> you know what I mean? But and I just I like forget that that's not like obvious because I I feel like that's so obvious. I <laughs> I don't know, and I'm like, oh no, they don't know. Like you have to talk about. <laughs> They don't know that you're um, like a total mess. Like I was, I mean, everything I would dislike about a person, I wouldn't, I would not have been friends with me. You know what I mean? No, no way, girl. No, you need, she needed some help, but it's okay because she got it. (laughs) That just shows Um, you that you can totally get out of that place, no matter how, how bad of a situation you're in or, you know, how your, your state is, there's always a way out and there's always a path that you can take to heal from it. I'm disappointed by how few people will be outspoken about the fact that in the same way that you can heal from a physical illness, you can heal from mental illness. I have healed from multiple mental illnesses completely. I've done it. I've known people who have done it. I have probably spoken to and connected to thousands of people who have done it. It is possible. It is not that it is easy. It is not that it is quick. It is that it is possible. And I wish someone could have said to me, I just need you to know that you can get through this, you can get over this, and you don't need to live with this forever because pretty much the only message I ever got was, you'll probably have to live with this for the rest of your life and just figure out how to manage it. And I was like, okay, well, uh, like, no, (laughs) right. Like, I don't, I don't, and then kind of, you know, over time, I was like, no, I can completely heal. I can completely change. I can let go. When I speak to people who I, I knew like 10 years ago, they're like, you are a completely different person. And I say, yes, I am. The only thing that's the same is my name mm-hmm. and where I came from and <laughs> the beginning of my story. Yes, I am. And I'm very proud of that. Yes, that's I am. Amazing. I love that. So you mentioned your book writing process a little bit, and I kind of want to talk about that because I'm so intrigued. I, I would love to write a book myself one day. So what is that process like? You know, what, what does it look like from your perspective? How hard is it? Or, you know, how did you actually get through it? Because I know it's a long process to write a book. That's a lot of words, right? And probably a lot of revisions and edits and whatnot. How do you stay consistent and actually finish the project? I can't give away all my secrets, but (laughs) I'll I'll give away a few. Um, It has to start with a really strong concept. So every time I've struggled, it's because my concept wasn't strong. And I think that's the foundation. I think that's why people struggle initially. They don't have a strong concept. They vaguely know. I'm like, I vaguely knew for a while that I wanted to write about self-sabotage. So I'm like, all right, I get the topic, but my concept wasn't like the mountain is you hadn't come to me yet. Um, I hadn't done enough of the work for it to come to me yet. So strong concept is important. Um, And then I think it's doing it piece by piece and breaking it down. So I break like a Google doc down into chapters and then like subheads in the chapter and sub points within that. And then I take it one point at a time and over time it just kind of gets done. Um, My other books have been like some compilation books. So just been stuff I've written over time. I've written so many thousands of articles over the years that it's just kind of normal to me now. And so I think that, you know, I I really do talk to a lot of people who write or want to write. And I I really hope over time that I can just help dispel all of this like anxiety around writing and what it means to be a writer. Like it's so annoying. Like you all just need to stop. But it really is. It's like everyone has this idea that like only some people can write and like 
they're most people think they're not smart enough to write or they they can't share what they're doing and it's like this is so nuts like there's space for all of us to do this like if it's something you feel called to and want to do you absolutely should there's probably something you need to tell the world like it's it can be an outlet even if you just do it in a journal it can be something you do online like what whatever like i I think more people should do it if they feel called to it and not worry, like, am I good enough? Am I smart enough? Like, am I smart enough? Like, who cares? Like, don't even think about that. Just like express what you want to express. And then I think you have to just, so I've sat down with a, a handful of people at least who have like really seriously wanted to work on books. Honestly, probably this year, I've probably talked to them. <laughs> people who really wanted to do books and like, I don't know, like, I'm not like, not like a huge, I don't know why people even ask me. I feel like there's so many other people who have so much greater insight. Like, I don't know. Um, I, I think that the other piece is that you have to really actually want it. And that's often what it comes down to is that they don't really want it. It's a big project. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of self-work. It takes a lot of research. It takes a lot of revision. It takes a lot of perseverance. And so, and I do think that plays into having a strong concept, which is that you have to really want it. You have to really want to do this and really be committed to it. Because I think that most people don't really want to, that, that, that don't do it, that say they want to and then don't. I believe people's desires. So if people, someone says to me, like, all I've ever wanted is to write a book and it's my, my greatest dream and I'll do anything to get there. I'm like, I, I bet you will. I bet it'll sell really well. I bet you'll be amazing. Um, but if they're like, kind of like, well, I would like, like to do this, but I don't kind of don't feel like it. Like I don't want to put in the daily work. And I'm like, then it probably won't happen just because what you're telling me is that you don't care enough. But that honestly like applies to so many things, starting a business like mm-hmm. hello, like, yes. I don't want it. <laughs> a lot of work, a lot of tears, a lot of sweat. <laughs> like oh yeah, like and the people that it doesn't work for, I often feel that it's it's not really what they wanted, and it's actually not for them, and that's okay because there is something else that is for, for them. So it's you know, it, it's not a problem. It's just we need to get in alignment with what we really, really desire. I don't know. No, I totally. I don't agree. know. <laughs> That's so true. Uh, So before we end, I want to involve my community here and there's some questions that they want to ask you. So I have four questions that I want to run by you. The very first one is how are you keeping productivity up during this time? So if this is being listened to down the road during the COVID-19 time. (laughs) Um, check the news once a day. Um, very mindful about what resources I am using to stay informed. Otherwise, I am deeply focusing on the opportunity that is in front of me, which is not, you know, exclusively productivity. For me, it's also been a time of deep rest, reflection, and gaining clarity about what I want moving forward. I, yeah, so I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I am being... <laughs> being my most productive self but that's okay because I I don't think that's what I need right now and I don't think that's what a lot of people need right now but honestly I also feel that in taking a step back and taking time to you know reconnect and with myself and my husband of course and my life in the future I actually think that's a profound source of productivity it just doesn't look like checking 20 things off of a to-do list which honestly is mostly just a distraction anyway so Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a good answer but that's my answer whatever you need at this time that you haven't been able to take, that is what you need to be doing. Yep. And it doesn't necessarily need to come in a form of a checklist or whatnot. Um, I think you're still productive because you're still using the time valuably and it's going to benefit you in the future. Yeah. And don't worry about like if someone else would think like, you know, you're accomplishing so much, like you need to connect with what you need in this moment to move your life forward, especially in a time of uncertainty. Um, And just know that that's enough. That's enough. Yeah. So what is on your reading list these days? With all this time, what are you reading? Um, actually, this week I am reading Tim Ferriss's The 4-Hour Workweek. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. If y'all haven't read it, y'all need to get it, download it. I don't know. Do something. Y'all need to read it. So, wow. I have not been so blown away by a book in, in, in a kind of a while. Um, and it's, it's an older book, too. I'm, and I'm sure I'm actually probably probably a lot of you already read it. So you maybe you'll understand what I'm saying, but when you kind of look at it and you see the title, you're like, yeah, sure. Like, let me see what you have to say. But like, you know, that's probably impossible. 
by page five, I like put my iPad down and was just like staring at a wall. And I was like, oh my God. And then by like page 10, I was like, I like called my two best friends. I was like, you need to read this now. I'm calling you on Thursday. We need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> like I just that's when I know that I'm really moved when I'm like forcing everyone around me to read it too so I can talk to someone about it. I made my husband download the audiobook. I'm like, listen to this and, and let me know when you're done because we need to talk. And then I get through a book pretty quickly, but I've really been taking my time with this. He's unbelievable and it's like every page has like a life-changing piece of advice on it. It's an easy read, but like every single page is valuable. Every single page makes you be like oh my God, that's exactly what I need to be doing. It's, it is amazing. That's awesome. It's definitely on my list. Um, it's in my queue right now through Audible. So I'm definitely going to maybe up it up a little bit. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. So what book do you recommend for starting a self-discovery journey aside from your own, obviously? <laughs> <laughs> I know you've said this before. First of all, I would never recommend my own. <laughs> can you imagine <laughs> My book. <laughs> There's actually a book on self-sabotage. <laughs> no, no way. Okay. No, we need to look to people far more intelligent and experienced than me to start your journey. Um, I would say one of my favorite books of all time is Eric Crichton's Resilience. That is a life-changing book. Um, Cheryl Strayed's Tiny Beautiful Things. Interestingly, both of those books are written in like a letter format. Cheryl's is like a, a, like an advice column, but like a really profound one. And um, Eric's book is actually a series of letters to a friend of his that came back from the army. So actually, it's interesting to me, the two of my favorite books are formatted very similarly. Um, so I would say those two. Yeah, I think that's that's what I have right now. Yeah, that's what awesome. I'm, saying. I'm definitely going to check them out. Um, and the last question is, what is your favorite way to take some me time? Oh, a long drive with the top down and mm. listen to music <laughs> and get a coffee. That sounds really nice. All things that we can't do right now. <laughs> All things I can't do right now. Okay, wait, uh, let's do a quarantine edition. Um, I've actually been taking like a hot bath with like candles like every night. It's been amazing. That's so funny. I've been doing that too, which I really? I hate baths to be honest, um, but there's just not a lot to do anymore. Oh. So I'm taking them, but I'm loving it. And I'm doing it like almost every night now. And I'm like, wow, Ooh, how am I going to stop? <laughs> I've actually been like reading in the bath and I've been calling it bath time. <laughs> it's time each day. It's bath time. <laughs> it's nap, snack time. I mean, I don't know if we have, we have much else going on. So. <laughs> I love that. All right. So if anybody wants to learn more about you, where can they connect with you? Where do you hang out online the most? Um, Instagram. Instagram slash Brianna Weist. Um, and my website has stuff on it, BriannaWeese.com. And for, um, yeah, I would say those two. And where is your book going to be available in June? Um, everywhere. Everywhere. So any store that sells books. Yeah. And also worldwide. Perfect. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Brianna, for sharing your knowledge and advice on how we can better understand our behaviors and overcome self-sabotage so that we're living the life we want and are worthy of. I know so many are going to enjoy and benefit from all your advice on this episode. Thank you so much for having me. You are amazing. And it was such a pleasure talking to you. I'm Jessica, and thanks for tuning in today to Love Unplugged, the podcast. If there are any questions or topics you'd love answered on the show, head on over to www.projectloveco.com and share your request with me. If you haven't yet, go to iTunes and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast and share it with a loved one. Your feedback means the world to me, and the community we've created is what fuels our discussions here. After all, this is all for you. Join me next time for another Unplugged Conversation.